Hello everyone, it's Mark. I am the Sanderson Collector and I am here with my friend Luke. This is Luke. I am Luke Bros. Um, and we are both big into Brandon Sanderson Collecting and are both founding members of the Sanderson Collectors Guild. And I saw someone I just have to go talk to right now. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. I'll run in the meantime. Um, so yeah, thanks for all coming out. Uh, we kind of wanted to set up basically a one-on-one -on -one panel for people that are getting into collecting. So this is kind of going to yeah, going to kind of run through some uh, main book overview topics uh, like how to identify what printing book you have, um, some of the different things that are particularly collectible for books. Um, we're going to run through signatures and uh, the different ways you can get things signed, um, where to shop for your books, and, and good places to get them these days. Uh, some of the swag and how that ties in with collecting. Uh, we'll get into some of the pricing and uh, especially after post-COVID, how much prices have skyrocketed on everything. Mm -hmm. um, we'll talk about protecting your books um, as well as cataloging your collection and then also talk about some uh, resources that we have. And feel free and just raise your hand and stop us at any point if you have questions. We'll also save some time at the end for questions there too. Yes, and there is nobody on the schedule after us in this room, so if you want to stick around after the panel and ask us questions or whatever, we should be here for a few minutes, and then after that, we will be down in the Sanderson Collectors Guild booth in the vendor hall, and you can find us at any time. Um, so getting started on book basics, so again, we'll just run through some of the different types of books, uh, and then how that kind of uh, impacts valuation and what's more collectible. So I'll kick it off with... Uh, the main thing that everyone thinks of when you're thinking of collecting your book is your hardcover book. That's going to be usually what gets released first whenever the book initially comes out. Um, it's something that a lot of times the publishers will keep running at least for the first year or two, uh, and then they start kind of transitioning to some of the, the lower budget models. Um, but again, your hardcovers, that's the main thing that uh, the collectors are going to be wanting to go after. Right. And one thing that sometimes happens, not always, but you will get, usually for the hardcovers after a year, they can transition to the trade paperback, which is the big floppy paperback. The Stormlight books have all done this. And some other books, such as the ones you can see here, like anthologies, come out a lot with just a trade paperback instead of the full hardcover. Yeah. So particularly when they are released just in trade paperback, that's when, you know, obviously as collectors, we're going to want to get whatever came out first. That's what people are going to typically want to be collecting immediately. Um, then you get into your mass market paperbacks. These are, you know, significantly shorter than your trade paperbacks. Um, these are generally not considered very collectible. Um, they're more just your reading copies and stuff. Um, that copy he's holding is like the only exception for Sanderson books where the mass market is actually collectible because the cover on that one is so horrible and y'all are welcome to come up at the end of the panel and take a look. That horrible that horrible cover nearly tanked Brandon's career and so it's kind of infamous and that one mass market is collectible. Yeah, um, and then on very rare occasions you'll have books that are only released in mass market paperback. Yeah. So for example, Brandon's I think the only book that really got released that way was an anthology called Armored, um, and it only was released as a mass market paperback. So yep. again, that's something that then becomes the standard for collectible, but not normal. Yeah. All right. Um, something that looks like a hardcover but isn't as collectible is the book club edition of a book. These are put out by like sciencefictionbookclub.com and a couple of other places. And you can identify these because they will have these little bar, like instead of just the barcode, they'll have this little set of numbers on the back of the book. Yeah, uh, this little line right there. And these are not first editions considered of the hardcover. Sometimes they're smaller, like you can see with the Wall of Ascension here, and they are not considered as collectible as the standard hardcovers. Most collectors do not go after. And then one of the things that is very sought after, particularly in the Sanderson collecting stuff, is advanced reader copies or uncorrected proofs. Um, they will look similar to a trade paperback. Um, they're you know 
softbound, but they will always say something along the lines of, you know, uncorrected proof, not for sale, or something like that. Uh, these are usually uh, intended for, you know, review copies. They just be sent out to some people in the media uh, to, you know, read it over in advance, give reviews, give uh, feedback on it, and stuff like that. Um, right, and that not for sale basically applies until the book is released. They don't want people selling early copies of the book to read it early after it's released. The people who are going to be collecting these things are going to buy a hardcover copy of the book anyway. They're not losing any sales. And so you will often see these pop up on eBay and other sites. And that's where we as collectors often find them. Yeah. And we'll get into it more with pricing, but significantly more expensive. Yes, question. Locations? Yeah, so the question was, do advanced reader copies ever get sent to libraries? Uh, yeah, that's decently common. Um, obviously, that's going to be more so with smaller uh, authors at this point. Like, I don't think Brandon's doing that. Uh, yeah. So good luck on that. Um, he's also, at this point, usually only doing like 100 or so of these printed. Um, so a lot harder to find. But I mean, for other authors, you'll definitely see that, where they'll send out advanced copies. Um, and it's not always even the author that's making that decision. A lot of times it'll be like, so if they're through Tor, Tor will be the one that their marketing team will distribute that. Yep, and yeah, these are usually the most sought after collectible because they are what was the first printed version of the book that was out there. And yeah, another question? Uh, so question for everyone, and I'm just gonna repeat questions so everyone can hear it. Um, the question was, do the ARCs ever come in hardcover? Um, on very rare occasions, I would say less than 1% of them are going to be that way. Yeah. Yeah, just It's more expensive for them to try and bind that up. Um, and yeah, no, the, this industry standard is definitely just trade paperback style. Yes, um, there is technically one Sanderson book that is labeled as an ARC that is a hardcover, and that is unfettered, but that is not a true advanced reader copy. It was just a version of the book that Grim Oak Press sold on their website and called an advanced reader copy, but it wasn't actually released early or anything like that. Yeah. The advanced copies ever go to the good reviewers. Yes. Yeah. 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 Hundred um, percent. And that's a good way for a lot of people to get uh, advanced reader copies, especially again. Not going to get that for Brandon, but for just other authors, yeah, that's a great way. They've got tons of giveaways. They're free. Again. They're meant to be for you know getting reviews in and stuff, so they're not meant to be for sale anyway. So hence they give them away uh, good reads. Within the essentially within the hardcover books, there are like super collectible books. When you get into the limited editions of books, um, some books like for this release party, we did numbered books just numbered on the page on the normal title page. Some books, they specifically print a certain number and number them. You can see that here with the Subterranean Press edition. Subpress is a big press that does this. And they will typically put out like a few hundred or maybe a thousand numbered copies and like 26 lettered copies. And those are super hard to find and super collectible even within the like category of hardcover. Cool. So again, talking on things that are, you know, you buy them and they're coming signed from your distributor. Um, so another version of this that you'll see sometimes is uh, basically a page at the front that sometimes we numbered and it's tipped in. Um, what that means is basically the book's bound up normally and they add one extra page and that is a signing sheet. So basically Brandon or whoever would get a stack of these sheets, would sign them all, and that single page gets added into the book. Yep, um, and this process is actually used for most of the leather bounds these days. They send Brandon a, sh a set of like the first 16 pages of the book. He signs the one page that he's going to be on and they send it back and bind it in. So it's slightly different from a tip in, but he still doesn't have the whole book when he's doing the signing. So it makes it a lot faster and easier on him. Yeah, and so recently, especially like in the U.S., we've had uh, Barnes & Noble doing that for like Star Sight, um, so that's the image on the left. And then for a long time there, the U.K. had been getting copies um, on the right, and so there's 
quite a few of those floating out, but again, very limited numbers, so fairly collectible. Yep. Um, and then the books that I assume we all got here are the numbered release party books. Um, these are the ones you buy at the release party or buy online from the release party. And um, one thing that is relatively new, they started with Rhythm of War, is doing the stamp to authenticate the fact that it's actually numbered. Books before that, you will see just a handwritten number somewhere on the page. Technically, you can't authenticate that someone didn't just get a signed book and write the number in themselves, which is why it is so cool that they are doing the stamp with the numbers for all of the releases these days. Yeah, and a lot of times, the, some some of these had been Brandon writing the numbers on back in the day. Some of them were some of his assistants. Um, definitely one of the most sought after things for collecting standards and books these days is getting a number and particularly a low number. Hence why you'll yep. see people like uh, Austin who's standing there in the back who got number one for this year and uh, camped out over there. Yep. So yeah, you will see, especially for Stormlight Archive books, people spending multiple days waiting in line just to get that number one. Yep. When you are collecting hardcover books, you want to collect the first printing. That is the first print run of a book that is put out when the book is released. And you can tell that it is a first printing by checking what is called the number line on the copyright page of the book. Most books, standard hardcovers will have this, the Tor books have it, the Delacorte Skyward books and so on have it, and it will be a number line that will say like 987654321. The lowest number in that line, except for occasionally the number zero, is the printing of that book. So if you had this number line here and the one was missing and it just went down to two, that would be a second printing of that book. Um, UK editions, you will see sometimes this alternating number line where it's got the evens on the left and the odds on the right. That is still a first printing because the lowest number you see there is one. Occasionally you will have books where they're nice and they just state first printing here. This is, I believe, from one of the Crafty Games books. Um, and so that is how you tell that your book is from the first print run and that is the most collectible hardcover books from the second print run on are generally not sought after by the collectors because they can just go ahead and get those at retail for most books that are still in print. Yeah, and I would say um, for smaller authors, typically your first printing might be you know 5,000 books to 10,000 books is pretty normal. Um, so if you're looking at things like Elantris that came out, you know, back in 2005 when Brandon wasn't nearly as big, I think that print run was about 5,000. Yep. Uh, versus nowadays, uh, you've got things like Oathbringer, and I think that one was like 150,000 or more in the first Probably. printing. It was, yeah. th they're massive now. Mm -hmm. um, so easier to get in some sense um, uh, for a lot of the newer ones. But again, like Mark mentioned, uh, once you hit second printing, the value for at least collectors tends to go down very significantly. Yep. Um, and another thing that can bring the value of a book down is something called a remainder mark. And this is a quirk of the publishing industry where the bookstore essentially does not have to buy the book until it is sold from them to the customer. They can just get a box of books in and then if they don't sell them, they tell the publisher, hey, screw you, we didn't sell these books, we're sending them back except it's too expensive, expensive to send them back, so they just stick a remainder mark on them. Or in the case of paperbacks, they will tear the cover off, report the book is unsold, and it'll like get sent to a bargain bin somewhere. Um, for hardcovers, this usually takes the form of just a Sharpie dot on the top or bottom of the book, as you can see here, and this significantly devalues the book for hardcover first prints. So this is something that had been a lot more of a thing that you'd see on eBay uh, a couple years ago, back when Brandon was still selling these on his website, but uh, signed book plates. So basically this is a sticker that gets signed by the author and then people can slap it onto their book and have it signed. Um, it's great for people like say living overseas that wouldn't you know normally be able to go to an event that say Brandon was at to get something signed. Yeah, um, I've seen people take um, signed book plates from Robert Jordan 
and put them in the last three Wheel of Time books to say that he actually, like, that was actually his signature and not just printed on for those three books. Yeah. Um, in terms of valuation, it's not very sought after collectible wise. Um, I think most of us collectors just kind of view it as uh, it's neat, but it's not something that we want for the collection, basically. Um, mm -hmm. Again, uh, for basically any living author, people are going to be wanting to go collect what's actually signed on there. Um, the one exception that, I mean, Mark hit on a bit, too, is like Robert Jordan or someone that's passed away, uh, those book plates can, you know, just on their own, the book plate can sell for several hundred dollars. Because, yes. again, that author is no longer with us. All right. Brandon's signature is now the thing that he does, but it has not always been that smooth. Um, I have a picture here that he did for me, um, well, he did for someone else at a Magic Draft and sent to me of what his signature has looked like over time. Um, and very occasionally you will see books pop up with an early signature from Brandon. This will usually be Elantris, Alcatraz 1, or Mistborn the Final Empire before he fully streamlined his signature and those early signatures are really cool and really sought after. And just because your book does not look exactly like the modern signature does not mean that it is a fake signature. So also talking on Robert Jordan a bit, so obviously uh, Brandon finished out the last three Wheel of Time books. Um, and so as part of the publication process, they wanted to have Robert's signature included on all of that. So that got included in the printing. Um, so every Wheel of Time book, 12, 13, and 14, you'll see will look like it's signed by Robert Jordan, but obviously you know, he passed by that time, so not, not actually signed. Um, unfortunately, uh, I think a lot of people either don't realize that or are trying to be a little shady, so if you're buying a book on, say, eBay, and you see signed Towers of Midnight, uh, just know that that's not Robert's actual signature signed on there. Um, it does make it really difficult if you're looking for, say, something that's signed by Brandon, because you just, again, you'd normally search signed Towers of Midnight book, and I would say 90 plus percent of the results you're going to get are just the Robert Jordan signature on there. So if you are buying stuff, just know every copy of that has that, so do not pay extra money for that. So. Yep. All right, and so as you're getting into collecting, you have to find books from special places, because you order a book like new off of Amazon or Barnes & Noble or whatever, you're just going to get whatever the latest printing of that book is. You're not going to get the collectible first printings. For those, you generally have to go to either the used listings on like Amazon, or you have to find a listing on another site. Um, some sites that we recommend for this. Um, we find a lot of our books on eBay and Abe Books. Both of them allow the seller to put their own description on the book and upload pictures, and so you can verify what you're getting before you click buy. More recently, Mercari has also been popping up with a surprising number of books. I actually saw a Defiant Arc pop up on there and get sold a couple weeks ago, and it is becoming a player in the game. Amazon, you can always scour the used listings and either message the sellers or check the description to see if the book is an early printing. Um, I don't actually remember why we had Barnes & Noble on this slide. It's just another place you can get your books. Um, yeah. I mean, in general, too, like, obviously, there's the release parties and stuff, or, um, you know, you come to this, you get your book and stuff. Um, if you're buying the book, you know, within the first month or so, you have a pretty good chance, even if you went to say Barnes & Noble, of still picking up a first printing, first mm -hmm. edition. So, um, as you're, as the books are releasing, obviously, you know, you can go to any store and pick them up. Barnes & Noble has an exclusive cover for Defiant. Yes, Barnes & Noble has an exclusive cover for Defiant, and I believe the copies they have here at the convention are signed. They are. And that's really cool. Um, another place you can find books sometimes is basically treasure hunting at used bookstores. In my part of the country, that usually takes the form of half price books, but pretty much any used bookstore, you go in there, you look for the Sanderson section, you see what they have, you pop it open and check the printing. Occasionally, you can find gems that are massively underpriced and luck out, but don't count on it. 
I will say for those of us that aren't from Utah, we are up here. There does seem to be a lot better finds up here locally, surprise. So definitely check out your uh, your local Salt Lake City bookstores. You might yeah. find some good gems here. Yeah, I, <laughs> yes. yeah, I called up a bookstore in the area a couple of months ago and just like asked if they had anything because a friend tipped me off with Mike and they had like a hundred dollar well of ascension advanced reader copy which <laughs> is easily worth five plus times that much and so i snagged that and it was a really lucky find cool uh so we'll dive into some additions. Oh, yes one question yeah good um so typically, like, I mean, people have that as an additional thing that they collect. They don't tend to get crazy valuable from what I've seen on any of them. But, I mean, they're still worth more than cover price for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's been some over the years. Like, Steelheart had a bunch of variations where, like, Walmart and Target. And, Books um, a Million and Barnes and & Noble. Yeah, all had variants as well. Um, again, they're collectible. They're not highly collectible, but I mean, yeah. they're, again, they're going to be worth probably, you know, a couple years down the road, double or triple the cover price. Yeah, and that is also a thing that the book industry is just kind of dipping its toe into with special editions and alternate covers. That's very much more of a thing in the comic book industry than it is for the prose book industry. Um, so yeah, uh, diving into some of the other collectibles. Um, so obviously there's lots of Promotional items, swag, things that came out with book releases that people would get. So this includes things like stickers, buttons, patches, lanyards. Um, so a lot of these things, again, were uh, basically free things that you would get by either you know visiting uh, one of the partner's books or something, uh, or booths at a convention. This would be things that you know if you bought it or pre-ordered it, you would get uh, you know a, a bookmark that comes with it and stuff like this. Um, again, prices on these things vary significantly. The older it is, usually the more it's going to be worth. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of these, I mean, there's lots of people that collect just the books, but there's also quite a few people out there trying to scavenge a lot of these uh, very old promo items. Yep. And, uh, yeah, okay, so yeah, that's the promotional items. Um, then there's also licensed merchandise, which has had a two-hour line this entire convention. <laughs> Um, and this is all of the other items that Dragonsteel or their partners put out. Um, for example, you can see we've got the coins here from Shire Post Mint. Those are not Dragonsteel themselves, that's another company, but they are licensed to put these out, and these are items that you can buy on a store. Most of these items they keep producing, and you can keep buying so they don't have a ton of value. Sometimes things will go out of style or out of, um, they will only do it like the Rhythm of War shirt here was just for that release party, I believe, and so you can't get those anymore and the value on those can sometimes climb a bit more. Um, you've also, we've also seen this with items from the Mistborn box from the year of Sanderson because they sold out of those on the Sanderson store. They have more here, but for a while they weren't available at all and so the prices on those items were climbing. Yeah, uh, the, the one very expensive licensed merch thing that comes to mind though is occasionally they had some pretty limited runs and one of them would be the foil Roshar map. Oh yes. Um, so it was a really nicely done uh, foil map that I think was, I don't know, 24 by 36 inch and uh, that thing goes for, I don't know, a thousand dollars, a lot. A couple hundred at least, yeah. A thousand if it's in good condition. Because those things bend easily. Yeah, there have been uh, numerous board games built around Brandon's universe. Uh, there's a Reckoner's one. There's Crafty Games has put out a series of Mistborn ones. Otherwise, Games has their Stormlight Archive game, and they're coming out with a Stormlight Archive RPG. Um, most of these are still available and not super collectible and don't cost more than they would from the store. Um, with the possible exception being the one game book, which might be on another slide, from, yeah, the hardcover game book from Crafty Games for the Mistborn Adventure game is out of print, and those go for upwards of 100 bucks now. 
Yeah, the other one I was going to point out is, um, so the Miss Born House Wars, they did do a 2,500 copy limited edition one, and they, those were all numbered on the back and everything. So there there are a few exceptions where they will be worth a lot of money, um, but it, again, usually cause there's something that is limiting on how many copies there are of that specific version. Um, again, you'll still see people getting them signed, and that obviously adds some value, but otherwise, again, like Mark was yeah. saying, they're... There's not really too many ways to find out printing on these. Um, I think Brotherwise is the only one I know of that actually does call out their stuff being first printing or second printing. So you can slightly add some value that way, but in general, not too much. No, Brotherwise. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, they list out what printing it is on the back. Cool. Um, um, yeah, and then I kind of touched on this already. There is a set of RPG books with the Mistborn game and most of those are still available. In fact, we were selling most of those at our booth this year, but um, the hardcover of the original adventure game is more valuable. Cool. Um, so kind of tied in with licensed merch and stuff. There's obviously lots of licensed uh, artwork and posters. Some of this through Brand Insight and some of it through his uh, artist partners. Um, again, uh, a lot of these things are, you know, they're fun to get. Um, especially if you get them signed and stuff, unless they kind of have a limited number on how many of, of that run, they're not super valuable on, uh, besides you know, yeah. what they're selling for, which sometimes yeah. is several hundred dollars. Yeah, and there are some that are limited runs, like some of the artists, Howard Lyon and I think Steve Argyle, have some limited run prints of their secret project artwork down in the vendor room that sells for a decent amount and will be worth that amount or more in the future. So diving into some of the rare books and how much to spend for some of these books. So we'll kind of start off at the low end, obviously. Uh, so again, usually your trade paperback or your mass market paperbacks, stuff like that, uh, trade paperbacks, basically your reading copies. Don't be spending more than like, you know, cover price at most, but a lot of times, especially if it's one that's come out for a while, you can go pick it up at any used bookstore, spend 20 bucks or less. Yeah. Um, so, first printings of new releases, you can usually get around or at cover price. Um, and so, like, right now you can probably find Defiance sold online near cover price for the first print, not, or just like, go grab one at your local bookstore, it'll be a first printing. And so, these are not super valuable when the book has just come out. Um, then you start kind of getting into your first printing of nine Cosmere books. Um, unfortunately, like despite how good some of these are, they just don't have nearly the draw that a lot of the Cosmere books have. Um, so a lot of times for first printing, they can be as low as like 40 bucks for ones that had a pretty high print run and aren't collectible, like Steelheart. Um, some of them get up, you know, as high as 100 or even a bit more. Um, but again, nothing too crazy, at least with the non-Cosmere first printings. So still great to get out there. Alcatraz is so under. Um, so when you get into the Cosmere books, that brings a bigger audience and therefore a bigger buying pool and a bigger bump in the price. You will be spending upwards of 100 bucks to get earlier Cosmere books on first printing. Um, we sold a first printing Way of Kings in the booth for, I think, 250 bucks um, yesterday. And uh, you can see, like, Elantrises will go for that much or more. And especially if it's in really good condition, just because, like, back then, the print run, like Luke said, was so low, and so there's so few of those around to be collected now. Um, so some of the limited edition or limited print runs, um, these start getting up higher and higher value, again, on the low end for ones that had quite a few printed out, like some of the later Legion books. Um, those are, you know, $100, getting all the way up to at least $400 or more for things like uh, Perfect State and Shadow of the Silence. Um, again, highly sought after by collectors, uh, and those values just seem to keep going higher each year, especially post-COVID. Again, all of these yep. prices uh, yeah. seem to have jumped. So a little bit of a tangent here, the history of prices, we've seen them just like slowly increase over time we saw a big jump with the Way of Kings Kickstarter when that was massively successful and raised, I think, like eight or nine million dollars. And then last year, no, the year before last, we saw a huge jump 
because COVID and everyone staying in and having their like stimulus checks just in, and then we had the Secret Projects Kickstarter that broke all the records and everyone was like, okay, yes, this Brandon guy is someone to watch and someone to buy and prices on some things. Like number war breaker leather bounds were going for fifteen hundred bucks or more on eBay when before that they would have been going for like six hundred. It was crazy to see some of the price spikes. It has settled down a bit since then. Um, we have a number of Warbreaker for sale at our booth for a thousand bucks now, for example, and um, we are probably expecting to see another jump next year when the Words of Radiance Kickstarter hits. So be on the lookout for that if you're doing pricing. Now is a good time to buy. It's probably only going to get more expensive from here. <laughs> So yeah, I'm touching on that. Uh, leather bounds, obviously. Again, a hundred dollars if you're buying it from the store, and that's a later printing. But any of the like first printings or numbers, those are highly collectible <laughs> these days and hard to find, and definitely go very high, especially for like uh, way kings. I mean, that's easy to find that, especially if it's numbered for fifteen hundred dollars. Yep. And the various advanced reader copies can span pretty much the entire range of prices. Like Luke touched on, some of the um, most common ones you'll get like Steelheart and Bestial versus the Evil Librarians and such. Those don't go for more than 100 bucks each. The most rare ones like Elantris, those will easily go for 1000 plus up to 2000 for some things like the Advanced Bound Manuscripts. Um, I have seen and paid some of these absolutely crazy prices in the past. Yeah, especially with some like Oathbringer and Rhythm War, where he basically limited it to 100 copies ish. They're very expensive, definitely in that 1500 to 2000 range for those. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so the question was how does the condition of the book affect price? Um, it certainly does. Um, if it's just got bumped corners, that's usually not devaluing it too much because that's unfortunately kind of common shelf wear that happens. Um, but if you start having things like there's tears on the cover or water damage, uh, that will very significantly uh, devalue it. And that is unfortunately something you see a lot more often on the advanced reader copies because they are the cheap paperbacks that the publisher wants to put out to do promo. Um, and also a lot of the times the booksellers just like don't really care that much about the book. It was just a free promo they got. And so they'll throw it in a bin somewhere and it'll be discovered a few years later after something has been sitting on it, and it can be in pretty bad shape. Yeah, they're shipped out in just a plastic mailer or something instead yep. of actually packed up in a box. So, yep. yeah. Um, but in terms of like hardcover books as well, um, you know, again, if you've got the bump corners, it's devaluing it, but not significant. Uh, honestly, the bigger thing that would devalue it immediately is, like we mentioned earlier, is the remainder marks. That's going to drop it almost back to cover price. And then, yes, the one book that is uh, possibly the most highly sought after hardcover in the collector community, that is the Infinity Blade Awakening book, and it is, yeah, there are people in the Collector's Guild who have standing offers of $2,000 plus on this book, and it sells for that much. Just Awakening, not Redemption. Don't come into our Discord and try to sell us <laughs> Redemption for that much. Yes. The Infinity Blade series is its own special thing. There are paperbacks of Awakening. I was told that they did a handful of those, basically as the proof copies of the book that were sent around to like Brandon's team and the chair team. Those are also super rare and super expensive. Yeah, and same thing with Redemption. There was well, not very Redemption, many paper. the paperbacks, were planned to be a, <clears throat> we will sell this to the general public release, and they printed up a couple hundred of those, never sold them, and then they found them and sent them off to Brandon when they closed down Chair, and he has been dispersing those at conventions and stuff, and so they aren't commanding an insane price right now. Yeah, go ahead. How much would you say a signed copy changes the price? And does it like, if you 
had like one of the artists sign it, is that affected as well? Yeah, so the question was how much does a signature increase value basically? And it does depend a lot from yeah. book to book and how early it is. And that is something we do cover later in the slides too. Yeah, it, it'll get touched on some. But yeah, it definitely does increase it. Yeah. Did you, do we have another question? Yes. Where do you get these stats on the size of the print runs and things? Where do we get the stats on the size of the print runs and things? Um, no people who know. Um, I asked Brandon, I asked Brandon's team. Um, we have people who have gone and found the programmers who were working for chair at the time and asked them. Look up old blog posts about this is how many books are going to be available and we're going to sell them here. Um, so a lot of the yeah. early ones too, Brandon's talked about it panels in the past where he's talked about how, you know, as a starting out author, again, he had that 5,000 to 10,000 release for yeah, he's uh, talked about Ms. that. Horton. He's talked about that when he's talking about just like general publishing economics, not related to the collecting, specifically just related to his career. So we get the information from there. Basically, from all over, from whoever knows. Yeah. All right. So signatures, yes. These days, Brandon's signature has become a scarce commodity. You can get it on the newly released, signed and numbered book. And that's about it, unless you're really lucky to get a signing line ticket, which I think maybe half of the people who pay to come to this convention actually can get something signed. Signatures these days can double the value of a book, depending on the book. If it's an Infinity Blade Awakening, that's not really going to change anything. If it's something like a standard first print, maybe even like Way of Kings hardcover, it can up to double the value of that book. Um, so signed and numbered can triple or quadruple the value of the book because those were even more limited and very low numbers can increase that even more. Like I don't even want to think about what Austin's number one defiant is probably actually worth because it's number one and that's insane. Um, I have seen very low numbers of books like we saw oh my God, the uh, low numbered Yumi that went up for charity auction went for like eleven thousand dollars this year and yeah it's low numbers can get really crazy because people want the lowest the best um and then like we touched on earlier the signed book plates don't add the same value as brandon actually signing the book they will probably only add a little bit to that value yes question how does a personalization Great question. So the question was, how does personalization uh, affect the valuation? Uh, it significantly decreases it, honestly. Um, I, most people, you know, aren't going to be the same name as whoever got that personalized, so that highly limits who would be particularly interested in it. Um, I would say you're, I don't know, instead of even doubling it, I would say it, it'd be less than just signed. Like flat signed, it's going to be worth way more any day than anything personalized. Yep. Now, the one thing that kind of ties in with that that does add a little bit of value is if it's, say, lined, so that'll be where Brandon takes a quote from the book or something or has, you know, a couple, a, a short phrase or something. Um, I mean, that slightly adds a little more value than just having it signed, um, and so that's good. Uh, the other thing that Brandon doesn't do it as much, but you'll see other authors do, is they'll date it, um, like the date they signed it. So obviously, like, the release party ones are release date. Um, but a lot of authors, if you, uh, they'll go on tour for signings, and so that might be a month long tour that they're doing all over the country for their release party, and they will date it. Um, and a lot of times, if you're finding something that's dated, uh, you know, shortly after release, that also tends to add some value. Um, and I know Brandon has done that for some books. It's not as common, but yeah. again, that I, adds value. I have several of my books signed, lined, and dated, and numbered. And what I had to do for those was get lucky to get to his signing line at the release event and ask him, instead of putting my name in here, can you put the date in here instead? And that does significantly bring up the value of those books. It makes them very more, very more words. Um, words are hard. It makes them much more collectible. So uh, diving into some ways to protect your books, since obviously, uh, you know, very expensive investments, and we want to keep them in good condition to keep that value up. Um, so one of the great things that a lot of people do is they'll get either barrister book cases, which is uh, the brown ones on the left, 
Um, you'll pay a decent amount of money for those if they're in good condition, or the, the thing a lot of us collectors have gotten that work very well and are not very expensive is Ikea has these. They're the Billy bookcases with the Oxford door, uh, like glass door covers. Mm -hmm. um, they're great, they hold tons of books, they don't warp under the weight, meaning like they're not dropping in the middle of the shelf and stuff. Um, and so you can get one of those sets for, I don't know, it was $300 for the double wide. Yeah. And they also look gorgeous for pictures. They look super official with all the level shelves and like the nice glass doors and everything. They look so good. Yeah, because in addition to protecting them, we still want to show them off. Yes. Um, speaking of protecting your books, something that you can do is put a road art cover on your hardcover books. And that is, you can come out and look after the panel. We've got one here that is essentially a little mylar cover that goes over the dust jacket to keep the corners from getting torn or whatever, especially if you're packing it to take to a convention to get signed or packing it to bring home from a convention. Um, sh shameless plug here, we as the Collectors Guild are offering road art covering as a service down in our booth. You can bring us your hardcover books, doesn't even have to be a Brandon book, pay us a couple of bucks and we will put the cover on for you to protect your dust jacket. And I just realized I didn't bring an example up for this, but I should have. Um, so for trade paperbacks, obviously they don't have the dust jackets, so you can't throw on a Mylar cover, but they do actually make um, Durasavers as well. Uh, so again, it's like a 10 millimeter plastic um, cover that you slip in, uh, like slip the book into, and that'll be a good way to protect your trade paperbacks or- Advanced um, reader copies. Yeah, or ARCs is the main one that you're using those for. And again, like, um, you can get these from Brodart. There's also just plenty of other uh, non-name brand ones. They're pretty cheap and easy to do as well. All right. So you have a bunch of books. You got them on a nice shelf. You have them all protected. Wait, what do I have again? Do I have that one? Um, so we have put together a website called Collecting Sanderson, uh, CollectingSanderson.com, and it is essentially a catalog of as many of the printings and editions and copies and everything of Brandon's books that we can find and get our hands on and get the info for. Um, and you can go on there and make an account and put in your books that you own by searching the site, finding the exact book that you have, you know, first printing of this or, you know, Barnes and Noble special edition of this and putting in, I have this edition of this in this condition and it will maintain a list of your entire collection for you. And I find it insanely helpful that I'm biased because I helped develop the website. And a lot of the info that went into that is from my collection, Luke's collection, and Austin's collection. Um, so some last minute plugs. Um, so again, as Mark mentioned, we're part of the Sanderson Collectors Guild. Uh, we've got a Discord. Um, don't, did you bring up bookmarks? No. Okay, we've got them down at the booth. Um, if you come down to the booth, it'll have a little QR code. Uh, basically, we've got a big community, um, lots of other collectors to come chat with. You can uh, just talk just general branded things, talk about collecting, buy and sell on there. Um, we also uh, have lots of great resources, so if you have any questions, uh, great community to join. Yep, if you have a book and you want to know the value, come ask us, someone will know the answer. Yes. So, um, in terms of uh, like, say you want to sell a collection or sell some spare copies of the book that you do yep. have, um, would you say that the collection is a good place to go? What yes. other places do you recommend going? Um, the two places I would recommend one, Collector's Guild, um, and then two, eBay. And eBay, you're going to be paying the eBay fees, and you're not going to know who your book is going to. Collector's Guild, you don't have to pay the fees. Sometimes you can get the same price. Sometimes it'll be a little less because you have fewer people buying the book. But you'll also know, like, hey, this guy over here got my book, and he's going to take good care of it because he cares. Also, it's great when you're selling to someone in the Discord because then if you're both going to, say, the release party, you can just meet up with people here and hand yep. it off to them and not have to worry about the post office yep. destroying your book. Yep. So yeah, that is super handy. I have yeah. handed off books to five different people. Over the con. Yep, I bought and sold this con too. So, yeah, it, it's great for that. Um, yeah, but again, like Mark mentioned too, I mean, eBay is always great. That's 
good market on there, and you can usually get top dollar. So, yeah, the main two. And then you want to plug your. Uh, we have another question in the back. Um, question is, why would people be selling the valuable copies of a book? And there are a couple of answers to that. Um, most of them are not good answers, unfortunately. Um, one of the reasons is people are just trying to make money off of it. Like, they'll buy the book early or like at release and then sell it later for more. Or they will buy a book like find it at a used bookstore and try to flip the book. Another reason we see fairly often is people are running into financial hardship in their life and they need to, you know, raise a little bit of extra money to pay their cat's vet, vet bill or whatever, and they will have to sell off part of their collection. I Some, huh? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's also plenty of people too, though, that have gotten out of, say, collecting or are wanting to saw some collection to go finance a wedding or something too. So there's good, there's good fun reasons too. Um, or again, yeah. just it's not their hobby anymore. So you will see that from time to time. Yeah. And you will also see like, there are some collectors who are not specifically looking to make a bunch of money, but who will buy up a number of the books on release and then sell them out a few years later, usually at or below market prices, just to make sure like the people in the collecting community can get a hold of those books later. Yeah, or use them for trade. Yeah, or use them for trades. Do you have Question. suggestions for where to find um, appraisers for Brandon's books? If they're not at the Hammer yeah. yeah, pop onto the Facebook group or the Discord and ask us. Okay. Yep. Um, Any yes. difference with uh, like the graphic novels that he's put out or those price per use he won't really? Um, so I mean like oh, White yeah, Sands sorry. one. We've been forgetting to repeat the questions. Oh yeah, uh, his question was uh, about the graphics novels and we'll talk about fully on those. So uh, like White Sands one, there wasn't very many uh, first printings. So I mean that's kind of decently collectible. Um, a lot of the other ones are close to just well maybe about double the original original price at this point. Um, so it's certainly collectible, um, but not like crazy high yeah. sought after. The one thing that obviously made it expensive for some is there are, uh, Brandon did do numbering for a few of those. Yep. So. Yes. Question here. So for graphic novels, would Brandon Anderson's uh, signature, the artist signature, be worth more for, from, from a collector standpoint? Okay, so the question was graphic novels, is it more valuable to have Brandon's signature or the artist's signature? And I would say Brandon's signature, just because Brandon is the name that is popular, you know, uh, Rick Hoskin or Fred Casas or whatever is not a popular person that 5,000 people will come to a convention just to see that person. So even though they may have put in more work and the art is really theirs and it's super cool to have their signature, it won't command as much value. That being said, they seem to be a lot harder to get signatures for. At uh, least yes. personally. So, yeah. Um, so, a little bit of shameless self promotion here. I am the Sanderson Collector. I run a YouTube channel and an Instagram, which you can find under the name The Sanderson Collector, where I collect all these books and then show off, as well as putting out videos to talk about, like, how to identify your first edition book or Here's the new additions that Glance is putting out with Sprayed Edges, which is a video I'm planning to do very soon. Um, this panel is actually going to be a video on my YouTube channel. I have my friend up here recording for me, and it will be put up sometime in the next few weeks. Cool. Any last minute questions from anyone? Well, yeah, and I guess a little bit more promo. Real quick, sorry. We are the Sanderson Collectors Guild. We have a booth down in the vendor hall. I think it's number 246. We've got like the Brodark covering. We've got some signs Skyward and Stars, or not Skyward, Stars Out and Cytonic. We've got the um, Secret Projects 1 through 3 tour editions of books and a couple of other things for sale. So yeah, come see us. Let's come say hi down at the booth. And yeah, any more questions? Yes. Like a first edition of the Wheel of Time books that you did fall into that. 
push toward a first edition of the Wheel of Time books that Brandon wrote fall into the non-Cosmere category? Yes. Mainly because those were so insanely popular already that they had a massive first print run for all three of those. I regularly see all three of those at half price books for less than cover price as first printings. That being said, they might eventually start to come out now that the Wheel of Time has got its TV series coming out. So. Yes. With Wheel of Time, first printings of Eye of the World go for 2000 up. First printings of Great Hunt go for like 500 to 1000 First printing of Dragon Reborn, maybe like 200 After that, it levels off to mostly cover price. Is that good? You got a ballpark cost of print up prices. Yeah, so, oh, yeah. Quest Stream was uh, ballparking how much Grim Oak, but Grim Oak Press is uh, number one. Um, so the first one is the one that everyone bought and then sold out real quick. I don't know, I've been seeing those going for over $2,000 easily. Yeah. So I, I, yeah, I, see, I see Cameron nodding back there. How much did you pay? I paid 2000 yeah. That's, <laughs> that's pretty much the market price for those because they had Brandon, and they had Pat. I think those were the two big name authors that got everything bought out super quickly. Yeah. Um, the later Unfettereds, some of those were even, I think, Unfettered 3, last I checked, was still on Sean's website. Yeah. Um, but Unfettered 1, that numbered limited edition, is super valuable. Yeah. So unless someone's selling it as a here's a matching numbered set, I would say the other two are basically the 250 or a little higher, maybe. Thank you all for coming out, and I hope you all have a great convention.